Hello, my name is Anthony Smart, and in this video we will be going over the sample classifier portion of the Chime 2 Parkinson's Mouse tutorial. This video will generally assume that you've been following the tutorials up to this point, and also that you've watched Jess and Ariel's lecture video on a sample classification, because in this video we will be discussing how to actually implement some of the ideas they discussed in Chime 2. So you can see I have these two files here, our feature table sequence dot a two table dot qza and our tabular metadata metadata.tsv these are the only two files you will need from previous portions of the tutorial to complete this portion if you've been following up till now you're fine you'll have these if you're trying to jump in at this particular portion of the tutorial you will need to go and get these from previous portions so looking at the tutorial itself Machine learning classifiers for predicting sample characteristics. So we will be using machine learning classifiers not to assign taxa to our ASVs like we did previously, but to attempt to predict different characteristics about our samples based on um, different metadata columns that we have. And we will be using a random forest classifier. This pipeline can access many different machine learning methods via the estimator parameter, but random forest classifiers are used by default. And if you watch Justin Ariel's video, you should be familiar with what this is. It's probably the most common type of classifier to use for this, which is why it's the default. So to get started, we'll be running a sample classifier, classify samples, which will take our feature table um, sequence, our tabular metadata, and also the metadata column we want to predict. Now uh, these two are just some more technical information that you don't need to worry about right now. And you can see that we have an output directory, not an output file. That's because this command will actually be outputting four different QZAs and three different QZVs. So we give it the directory to put those files in. So I'll copy this, paste over here and run. And it shouldn't take too terribly long to run. And when it's finished, you'll see that we have seven files four QZAs, three QZVs, all in this sample classifier results directory. And there we are. So what are we going to do with this? Well, what we're going to do is check how we did. How well did we actually uh, assess uh, which gen the genotype and donor status of our different samples? And the way we do that is by looking at our accuracyresults.qzd. In order to do that, I will go over here to our remote sample classifier tutorial directory. I will hit refresh, and you can see that we have sample classifier results here now. And this slash at the end means that this is actually a directory as opposed to just a single file. And this is where all of the results of the command we just ran went. So if I click on this, you can see we have our QZVs and our QZAs that were output from the command we just ran all bundled together in this directory. And what we want is accuracy results. So I will right click on accuracy results, copy link address, open a new tab, look up chime to view, go here, view a file from the web, paste our um, address that we just copied into here, click go, and here we are. And I've already zoomed in a bit, but I'll zoom in a bit more so you can see this heat map well, because it's a quite small heat map. Um, what does this mean? This table down here does a good job of explaining it to people who aren't familiar with these heat maps, so we'll start here and then we'll look back up at this. So what this means down here is that we classified 100% of susceptible and healthy mice as susceptible and healthy mice, which is correct. We classified 100% of susceptible and PD mice as susceptible and PD, which again is good. And we classified 100% of wild type and PD mice as wild type and PD, which again is good. But for wild type and healthy, we classified two thirds correctly and we classified one third as susceptible and healthy, which is still pretty good, but not, not as good. And you can see in this heat map here, that's what this is saying. Wild type and healthy, susceptible and healthy. 
So you can see here the, the different colors are the proportion of the mice that were classified from wild type NPD, say, as wild type NPD. So this means here that wild type and healthy we had about 66% classified as wild type and healthy, and we had about 33% classified as susceptible and healthy. Um, and our overall total accuracy was 0.9, so 90% accuracy overall, which is pretty good. So overall accuracy is computed as the uh, number of correct classifications over the total number of classifications. So this overall accuracy being 0.9 does mean that 90% of our classifications were correct. But um, if, let's say, we had five times as many wild-type NPD mice as all three of the others combined, then most of our classifications would be wild-type NPD. So if we were completely accurate with wild-type NPD and not accurate at all with the other three, we could still have a high overall accuracy, even though we really only accurately calculated the, um, or really only accurately classified one of the categories of mice. So that's just something to keep in mind there. This baseline accuracy is effectively represents the sort of what accuracy you would expect to get from random chance. It's basically computed as if we gave all the mice the same classification, what would our accuracy be? And it's the number that we want to beat with our overall accuracy. And accuracy ratio down here, as I'm sure you can tell, is overall accuracy over baseline accuracy. So if this accuracy ratio is below 1, it means you're doing worse than random chance, which is not good at all. If it is 1, you're about on par with random chance, which is still not great. But what you really want is for it to be well above 1. So as you can see, we have 3 here, which is pretty good. It means that our classification is beating random chance by a substantial margin. Now there's a follow-up question on this as well that says, try, just for fun, try predicting some of the other metadata columns to see how easily cage ID and other columns can be predicted. So we did pretty well at predicting genotype and donor status. Let's try doing it with cage ID. So in order to do that, I'm going to go back to our terminal. I'm going to clear this because it's getting a bit messy. I'm going to press the up key up arrow until we get back to the command that we entered previously. And for metadata column, instead of genotype and donor status, we are going to try to predict cage ID. So we will hit run on this. But first, you know what, first I'm actually going to change our output dir as well to sample classifier results cage so that we don't overwrite our previous results. And let's go. And this will generate those same seven outputs, the same four QZAs and the same three QZVs, but in sample classifier results cage. And instead of trying to predict the um, type and status, type and donor status of the samples, this is trying to predict the cage ID. So in order to view the um, accuracy results for this, I'm going to go here. I'm going to go back out of sample classifier results. In the sample classifier results cage, I'm going to copy the link address for the accuracy results QZV in sample classifier results cage. I'm going to go to Chime Tools View, and I'm going to view a file from the web. And so you can see we have something that looks similar, but uh, we did not do nearly as well this time. So we classified 100% of the mice that were from cage C31 as being from C31, same for C44 and C49, so cage 31, uh, 44, and 49 were fine, the others not so much. So C35, we thought 50% were from 31, we got 50% correct, 42, same thing, we got 50% correct, 50% we said were 35 and so on and so forth for 44 as well. And our overall accuracy this time was 60% instead of 90%. And you can see that reflected in the heat map. Instead of a nice clean diagonal line of mostly 100%, we have a, a bit more of a mess going on. So clearly it was a lot harder for us to predict the cage ID than it was for us to predict the um, 
genotype and susceptibility based on this classifier and this data. So that's just you know something to keep in mind. Just because you were able to predict one metadata column very well doesn't mean you'll be able to predict the other ones very well. So moving back to the tutorial, it does look like we did pretty well for the initial run on genotype and donor status and significantly less well for cage ID unfortunately. So we can see what, feature what features are most predictive of each sample class, donor and genotype groups. The important scores are stored in this sample classifier results feature importance.qza artifact. This can be viewed with the chime metadata tabulate command we talked about earlier. So how do we do that as a bit of an aside thing? Well, we come in here and we're going to run chime metadata tabulate on sample classifier feature importance.qza. So that's our input metadata is sample classifier results feature importance.qza and our output uh, visualization we'll just call mm, uh, what about just feature importance.qzv. We will run this and here we have our visualization feature importance.qzv and if we go view that copy link address I'll just go back to this window I'm already in back file from the web paste we have our IDs and the importance of that feature ID for predicting, in this case, it was the genotype and susceptibility of the mouse. So if we sort by importance, we can see a lot of them, not important at all, and a spattering of importance through here. So moving back to the tutorial, we're going to run one more command. We will, here we will generate a heat map showing the mean abundance of the 100 most important ASVs in each genotype and donor group. This will allow us to visualize the data we just tabulated in a more visual manner as opposed to simply reading through numbers, which humans are notoriously bad at. So this will again take our uh, feature table. It will take our importance artifact that we just viewed. It will take our metadata and it will take the column again, as well as some more uh, technical information. And then also work our outputs. We're going to output heatmap QZV and a filtered table.qza. And this is the one that we really care about here because we'll be viewing it after we run the command. So I will copy the command, all clear for the sake of cleanliness, paste and go. And once this is done, we'll be viewing sample classifier results heatmap.qzv to answer the question that is posed right after this command. So there we have it. And the question, what features appear to different, differentiate genotypes? What about donors? Are any ASVs specific to a single sample group? Now, we'll go view the heat map. It might look a bit intimidating at first, but I promise once you get the hang of it, the heat maps are surprisingly intelligible. So we're going to go to sample classifier results. We're going to take our heatmap.qzv, copy the link address, once again, paste it in here. And for this one, I might actually have to zoom out because this is going to be quite large. Mm. Yeah, I'm going to zoom out a bit further. There we are. So we can see we have over here wild type and healthy, susceptible and healthy, susceptible and PD. Wild type and PD are different categories. And down here, we have the most important features in determining these categories as taken from uh, that file we viewed previously. And so you can see here that if those features weren't present we'll have a black square. So for instance this particular feature was not present in any of these three categories but it was present in wild type and PD. And going back to our question what features appear to differentiate genotypes? What about donors? Are any ASVs specific to a single sample group? Well, we already just answered that. 
uh, all of these are only wild type in PD, and we can tell because the squares are black for all of the other categories and have a lighter color for wild type in PD. This one actually is present in all three of these, but in fairly low quantities here, and so on and so forth. And you can see these ones over here on the other end are actually only present in wild type and healthy, completely black for all the other ones. So yes, some of our ASVs are only present in certain categories. That's just where, you know, three of the boxes are black and one of them is a different color, indicating that it wasn't present in the categories where the box is black and it was present in a category where the box is colored. Now as far as which ones actually differentiate, well, we can see that up here for the two healthy ones. We have a lot of presence over here in the healthy, but not in the PD which suggests that maybe these are some of the differentiating uh, ASVs. And similarly over here, we have these in the PD, but not so much in the healthy, which suggests that maybe those are more differentiating factors for them. So that yeah, that is how you do sample classification in China too. I hope you learned something here, and I will see you later.